even really need a sermon after that. Careful. <laughs> this hurt my feelings at night. Well, it's good to have you here this morning. Thank you for being with us and uh, looking forward to what God has in store for us as we take a few minutes and finish this series on steadfast in your faith. Uh, if you're a guest with us today, I do want to say thank you for being with us. We're honored that you're here and also want to welcome our members here at Open Door and uh, just excited about today and, and for this particular message and also for a special night, uh, which we have tonight. Hebrews chapter 11, if you don't mind turning there, Hebrews chapter 11, and if you don't happen to have a Bible with you today, we've provided some in the pew, uh, if you'd like to just reach forward and, and take that and uh, look into the Word of God with us as we really are only going to turn to maybe two or three passages here this morning, the bulk of our time will be spent here in Hebrews chapter number 11. And also there should be uh, some notes for you either in the bulletin or if you don't happen to have a handout with you. Let me just double check. Did we do we need any extra ones? No, that's okay. You, you guys all have them from last week. If not, they will have them up here and you can just follow along. And as we go through this particular message, I think we ran out of the little booklets. Hebrews chapter number 11, and we're going to read just about oh, seven or eight verses here. And then I'd ask you to pray with me and ask God's blessing on our uh, time together as we look in, into the word of God. Uh, prior, I just want to read this to you prior to reading Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, every once in a while, somebody will send something to me I'd like to share with you. Uh, I get a kick out of this one. Uh, tells a story about uh, years ago how most families uh, with homes in the country used an outhouse. And a boy, one particular boy in this, in this family, he hated the outhouse. He just hated it. It was always hot in the summer where they lived. It was always cold in the winter. And it always stunk. And he was just tired of it. And so that particular outhouse sat on the bank of a creek. And the boy determined that one day he was going to push that outhouse into the water. It kind of was right next to a creek. And one day after the spring rain, the creek was so full, he decided he was going to push that outhouse into the creek. So he got a large stick and he pushed it in. And finally that outhouse toppled into the swollen creek and then floated away. Well, that night at dinner, his father confronted his son and said, somebody pushed the outhouse into the creek today, son. Do you know anything about that? And the son paused for a minute. He said, yes, yes, sir. He said, that was me. I, I did that. And he paused again for a moment. He said, but wait, dad, I read today in school that George Washington chopped down a tree and didn't get in trouble because he told the truth. The father replied, said, well, son, George Washington's father wasn't in the tree when he cut it down. <laughs> I even got Micah to laugh on that one. Yes! He tries so hard not to. Amen. All right, I really am going to admit, I don't know how you transition from, Hebrews, uh, from that to Hebrews 11, but we're going to try. And uh, look at just a couple verses here. It's good to be saved, amen? It's good to be saved. Hebrews chapter 11, just notice if you would in verse number, uh, we'll look at starting in verse 31. And the Bible says, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And then it goes on in verse number 32 as you conclude this chapter and says, What shall I say? Or shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, and of Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. 
They wandered in deserts and in mountains and dens and in caves of the earth. And these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the wonderful music that we were able to sing this morning and worship you in song. We thank you for this place, this local assembly that we can meet together and, and, and the liberty that we do enjoy. We, we thank you for it. And God, we thank you for salvation that it's absolutely free apart from our works. And God, we thank you that you give us a book that, that gives us tremendous relevant admonishments for the day in which we live. And we do ask this morning that you would grant us some insight and wisdom into this particular passage. And I pray that you'll use it to encourage us as we close this series to remain steadfast in our faith. And we'll thank you for it. Pray if there's somebody here today not saved, they don't know Jesus Christ as their personal savior, that today would be the day they put their faith in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as their only hope for heaven. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name and amen. Steadfast in your faith, part number four. Now this passage we just read is a tremendous depiction of what uh, of a, a group that were not so perfect uh, had accomplished and, and they finished and they finished well and they finished clean. And this is a particular passage that encourages us to remember the importance of remaining steadfast in our faith. And I think we're living in a day and age where our faith is going to be challenged even more so. You take a young person in school and some of the things sometimes that they're challenged with. Uh, you take a, a coworker maybe that challenges you in what you believe. Maybe it's a relative that you've been witnessing to and, and they begin to ask you questions. What about, what about, and what about? And no matter what, we have a media, I believe, that is relentless when it comes to basically mocking Christianity and, and mocking the Bible and, and for, for what I hold so dearly and many in, in, in the media today and it's unfortunate but true and it's escalating and many people say, well, you know, they're not going to persuade me. Well, I'd, first of all, if a man thinks he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. But I also say there's a myriad of young people with impressionable minds that, you know, they may be raised in the Christian faith, but when they hear some uh, pro athlete or Hollywood star that maybe they look up to mock what, what you have so invested in your, in your kids and then in turn begin to question what they believe or maybe even silence them from even sharing their faith. And it's kind of disappointing, but true. And it has to do with your faith. And that's why it's so important to remain steadfast. And, and when we think about those that maybe mock it or come against it, I want, I want to remind you this. Don't, don't forget this. The Bible, the New Testament prophesied, it foretold that prior to the Lord coming back, that this would take place. Uh, let, let me share with you just one verse, and behind me they'll have this. You don't need to turn there. Second Peter 3 and verse number three, it's actually verse three and four, uh, says this, knowing first that there shall come in the last days, notice what it says, scoffers. So just pause there for just a minute. In the last days, and, I, and again, I'm not going to get into a whole dissertation of eschatology, but I believe this, we are in the last days. Uh, numerology in and of itself would tell you that. What's going on with Israel would tell you that. Um, the year 6,000 would tell you that. All of these, all of these things, the, the condition of the church would tell you that. But we're living in the last days and, and, and you have to remember that as time goes on, more and more scoffers will come and they will make fun of what you believe and what you hold so dear. And one of my jobs and the reason I'm doing this series is to encourage you and to remind you to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So it says, they'll come, scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying to you even, hey, 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 Where's the promise of his coming? Since the father, fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they are. They're basically saying, you know, you, you guys have been saying for years the Lord's coming back. It, keep in mind, it, it, if people say that, we know, number one, that God never, ever, ever, and cannot lie. He promised he's coming back. And 
I'll tell you, he's coming back sooner than many people think he's coming back, and you can tell that in many respects. And as time goes on, uh, evil men, we know this, evil men will wax worse and worse. We know that iniquity, the Bible says, shall abound, which means it becomes more and more dark, more and more dark. I still believe there can be pockets of revival. I pray for it. I pray that God have mercy on our country. I pray for revival. I, I have not thrown in the towel, I can tell you that. But I do know just simple uh, last days of the church, evil men will wax worse and worse. Iniquity will abound. And the Bible goes on to say, and the love of many will wax cold. And I dealt with that a little bit on Thursday night when I was teaching on having the right spirit and fighting against that spirit of apathy because we live in such a dark day and we live in such a hard time. Uh, when it comes to that, many people just become cold. So the response to it is really our theme. Be steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So notice in your notes here, I want to give you just a few things uh, this morning on, I call this more the benefits of the life of faith. Uh, notice your first thought here, uh, your faith redeems your unpleasant past. Your faith redeems your unpleasant past. Look at verse number 31. I want you to notice here, the Bible says, by faith harlot, uh, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she received the spies with peace. Now, if you look at verse 31, if you know the story of Joshua, you see the, you'll remember the Israelites were about to enter Canaan. They were about to claim the promised land. And the first city that they would have faced would have been that great walled city of Jericho. And when the spies entered Jericho, they came to a particular house, the house of a harlot by the name of Rahab. And one of the things I love about the Bible is it doesn't gloss over anything. It just tells it straight, what, what, what it is and what it was. She was a prostitute. She was a harlot. But, but here's the thing. Something changed. Uh, we don't have really the, the Bible does not afford us to go into uh, all the history of what took place in her life. But you got to admit, when she made this uh, statement to them, come on in and I'll hide you and I'll protect you, something that had happened in, in, in Rahab's life. And she was not the girl she used to be. Something changed. And, and keep in mind, and this is a picture of the grace of God. And, and if you study your Bible, you'll find out that Rahab is actually in the lineage of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. And all of it took place, if you look at verse 31, by faith. By faith. Many of you would say, well, what does Rahab have to do with me? Well, my response to that is, you may not have been involved in the immorality that Rahab was involved in, but if you're, if you're saved, God redeemed you from a not so pleasant past. Many, many people just see themselves more as respectable sinners. You understand what I'm saying? Just respectable sinners. But think, God looks at things just a little bit different. Sin is sin in the eyes of the Lord. You may not be a harlot, but if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you're lost and in need to be redeemed. Uh, notice his, oh, in the story in Joshua, I, I won't have you turn there for the sake of time, but you remember uh, Rahab here and those that lived in that particular city in Jericho. Uh, that city, you have to remember, a city that was slated already for destruction that had already been foretold. God had already determined that Jericho was going to fall. And, and I'm ch sharing this with you for a reason, just got a little parenthetical here so you understand something I think is a good point in this message. I'm sure the people behind that walled city felt pretty comfortable. They, they felt pretty safe. Here's the interesting thing about it. There are many people today outside these walls. You may be sitting here today because I don't know your spiritual condition. They actually feel pretty safe. They feel pretty safe. The city of Jericho had already been slated for destruction. I'm going to show you a verse for those that don't know Jesus Christ, just as a reminder. You may feel safe, and sometimes uh, money or success can give somebody a false sense of security. John chapter 3, uh, they'll have this behind me, John chapter 3 and verse 36 the Bible says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. 
He that believeth not is condemned already. So here they are, you know, behind the wall and felt safe. Well, the thing was slated for destruction. This might be a person over here who's lost, but they feel safe. He that believeth not is condemned already. The wrath of God abideth on them. The Bible's crystal clear. Listen to me, please. There is a heaven. There is a hell. And if you're lost, you don't go to heaven. The Bible says in Revelation 20, 15, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So it's imperative. Check yourself. 1 Corinthians 15, make sure you're, or 16, make sure you're in the faith. And that is that you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Rahab is a picture of how faith can deliver you from a not so pleasant past. Once Christ comes in, everything begins to change. Listen, it's a miracle. That's why they call it the new birth. I read a story years ago that always stuck with me. And it was a story about a kind of a, a, a rather rough, uncultured man who for some reason, he fell in love with a beautiful vase that was behind a, a window in a store. And he'd walk by it every day to work and he'd see it. And finally he went in, kind of this rough, uncultured guy. He bought the vase and he went home to his house and he placed that vase on the mantle of his house. And pretty soon in time, that beautiful vase began to pronounce judgment on all of the surroundings in his room. Eventually, he had to kind of clean the room up to make it worthy of the vase. The curtains looked dingy beside it. The old chair with the stuffing coming out of the seat wouldn't do. The wallpaper needed redoing. The paint needed to be done. And gradually, because of that vase, listen to me, the whole room was transformed. You say, what does that have to do with me? When you put Jesus Christ on the mantle of your heart, everything else begins to change. Rahab, by faith, is a tremendous picture of the grace of God. Every time I read that story, I'm reminded of David in Psalm 40. He says in verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. He pulled me out of a horrible pit and out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings. And he put a new song in my mouth even praise unto our God. And the Bible says, and many shall see it in fear and trust in the Lord. Secondly, would you notice your faith supersedes your weakness. Your faith supersedes your weakness. All of these men had weaknesses. Look at verse 32. And what shall I more say for the time would... Uh, fail me to tell of, of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, Samuel and the prophets. So here we see the, what I call the Owen oh, by the way crowd. The writer of Hebrews tells us the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah. These are four, just the first four are four flawed heroes that you read about in the book of Judges. Gideon defeated the Midianites despite his fears. If you study Gideon, you'll find out that Gideon came from the smallest tribe. Gideon was the smallest in his family. Gideon was found on the backside of a hill and he just had a little handful of meal. And God comes up to Gideon and he says, oh, hail thou mighty man of valor. Gideon's like, who, me? He says, yeah. And God used Gideon to defeat the Midianites despite his fear. Barak defeated the Canaanites after being forced into battle. Samson defeated the Philistines despite his moral compromise with Delilah. Jephthah defeated the Ammonites despite making a rash vow that cost the life of his virgin daughter. Now, understand, none of these men were wholly admirable. They were all messed up in one way or another, which makes them pretty much like us. How many of you remember Tony Shirley, the first time he preached here, pastor from North Carolina, he preached a message, I think he titled it, We All Have Issues. Anybody remember that? I mean, and it's always stuck with me. And when I read that text and I talk about, uh, you know, our faith supersedes our weaknesses and all these men in the Bible all had flaws, it reminds me that, that, that really, if God can use them, surely he can use us. Gideon felt unqualified. Jephthah, the man who knew uh, rejection. Samson, the man whose life was controlled by the passion of women. 
and David, the one who slew Goliath, yet he couldn't take his eyes off Bathsheba, and so on and so on and so on. We need to get over the misconception that God only uses perfect people. Just, just get it out of your mind. I, I, I mean, if you're, uh, Pastor Kennedy always says, perfect people scare me. I love that. If you're here and you haven't been coming for very long, and, or maybe it's your first time or your fifth time or whatever, you're looking at a local assembly that is full of sinners saved by the grace of God. There's no pretentious anything. And if there is, then that's not right. We need to just make, make sure that we remember where we came from. Where we came from. And just a simple cursory reading of Obviously, the 12 disciples, you'll see all of their idiosyncrasies and Peter and denying the Lord three times, doubting Thomas, you know, all the, all the different things that you find. And this is God uses ordinary people. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the, and I love this, he says, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. The foolish things. God has chosen, he goes on to, in that same text, and says, God has chosen the base things of the world, the base things, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things which are, why? You read the last verse in verse 29, why does God choose the base things? Why does he choose ordinary? Why does he, you know, people say, well, if, so if this person with this platform got saved, imagine the influence. God doesn't need that. He doesn't need that. God chooses ordinary, the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Verse 29 in 1 Corinthians says, why? So no flesh would glory in his presence. That's why. The base things, the things which are not. Thirdly, would you notice your faith overcomes the odds. Verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, Obtain promises, stop the mouth of lions, quench the violence of fire, and so on. The thing I learned about preaching this particular passage is every statement, every person, every individual has a, there's a, there's a sermon behind every one of those guys. So I figured I would just preach this through into the banquet tonight and we'd just make our way. Because this is loaded. And so what I had to do, what I had to do, it's not because of the Pro Bowl, please. I, what I had to do is I had to just pick one, maybe, and hit a few of the salient points in one of the indiv individuals. And I, I picked, uh, or really it's three, but the stop the mouths of lions, we know that's Daniel. Quench the violence of fire. And that's Shadrach, that's Meshach, and that's Abednego. When I was a little kid, that was one of my favorite stories in the Bible. So I want you to turn. I told you I'd only have you turn to a couple pages. Hold your place in Hebrews 11. Look at Daniel chapter 3. They'll have a few of the verses behind me, but look at Daniel chapter number three. Overcoming the odds, one of the greatest pictures is Daniel and the lion and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. You remember they're thrown into the fire, but something amazing happens. Instead of dying in the flames, they're loosed from their bonds. They're walking around in the flames. Nebuchadnezzar can't believe his eyes. He commands them to come out, which they do, and totally unharmed, we see, by the flames. But something amazing took place. How did this preservation, to follow me, and, and I have to say this, please don't miss this. This is not some fictitious thing that's some allegory or that's just, you know, well, you know, just to kind of paint a picture. This literally happened. Jonah was literally in the belly of a whale. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were literally thrown into the fire. You say, oh, man, I have a really hard time believing that. Well, then just pause for one second and look at your human body. Look at your eyes, your ears, your hands, your feet, your heart, your lungs, the, everything about your body, the creation, the mountains, the sun, the moon, and the stars. If God can create the heaven and the earth, create the complexity of the human body, he can preserve three men by faith who were thrown into a fiery furnace. Every word of God is pure. So, here's the story. And, and, and they, uh, oh, they overcame the odds by faith. I won't read the whole thing of Daniel, but basically... They say when they're getting ready, they're bound. They're getting ready to th be thrown into the fire. By the way, if they would have acquiesced, 
and they would have just given in to Nebuchadnezzar and done what he wanted them to do, they wouldn't have been thrown in the fire. And they made this statement. They said, hey, whether God deliver us or whether he doesn't, we're not going to bow and he's still God. That is amazing. So they went in not knowing what was going to happen. Well, Daniel chapter 3, they're thrown in the fire. Without reading the whole story, just look at verse 25. Here's Nebuchadnezzar. He, sa he, he says, wait a minute. That's in the Hebrew. I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and no hurt. And the fourth, the, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Okay, time out. Time out. Wow. I mean, a Christophany, that, I mean, what... Would that, is that what, did I say the right word? There it is. Okay, thank you, Pastor Kennedy. Picture this. What, there's, they throw them in and all of a sudden, there's four now in the fire. That's faith overcoming the odds. What are the chances of that? And by, by the way, when they opened the door to throw them in, the servants, the were soldiers, guards that threw them in, were killed because the fire was so hot when they opened the door because it was how many times hotter? Seven times hotter when they would normally turn it up. And it says when they came out, not even one of their hairs was singed. The smoke, the smell of smoke wasn't even on them. But bigger than all of that is in this particular story, all of a sudden he says, wait a second, I threw just three in there. Why is there four? That's God in the flesh, in the form of the Son of God, which it says in your Bible, like the Son of God, preserved by an ever-present God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the flames, but they found that they weren't alone. The God they professed by faith met them in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar and others with him could not believe their eyes. Now here's a lesson for you and me. Even in the furnace in Babylon, God kept his promise to his people, and we have the same promise today. 3,000 years later, we know Hebrews 13, I will never leave you or forsake you. We know Matthew 28, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. When the flames rise around you, open your eyes. Whatever the trial is, he's right there. Notice what happened because the Lord met him in the fire. They were free in the fire. It says, if you saw the verse, they were walking around in the fire. They were free in the fire. The Lord used the fire to loosen these men from the ropes that bound them. When the fires and persecution and affliction come into your life, you need to remember this truth. The Lord is merely freeing you from some things that have bound you in your life. The furnace may be frightening, but you were not brought there to it for destruction, but for growth. God did not allow it for your hurt, but for good. You say, well, what New Testament verse do I have to support that? I'm glad you asked. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, I think I put that in the notes, for our light affliction. <laughs> I know, I always, every time I hear that, when somebody's really going through a hard time, it sure doesn't seem light, does it? When you're in a valley or a trial or a hardship, you got marital problems, you got financial problems, you got health problems, you got all kinds of things going on at work, whatever the pressure is, and then we read the verse and God says, our light affliction. It doesn't seem light when you're in it. He says, which is but for a moment, we're like, when is this thing gonna end? See, God's timetable is different than ours. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, I, I can't get over this, worketh for us. I mean, there's a purpose behind it, just like the fire in Daniel 3. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Even though the flames may come, they will only free you from what binds you. And it's important to remember that. Uh, by the way, as a little side note here, we know there was three thrown in. Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace. He saw four. He called for the men to come out of the fire. You're in Daniel 3. Look at verse 26. It'll be the last verse I see in Daniel, but you've got to see verse 26. He says, Nebuchadnezzar came near to the, 
to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and he spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the most high God. See, he just got converted. He's like, what in the world? No, I got the wrong, uh, the wrong God here. He, he calls them the servants of the most high God because he's blown away. He says, come forth and come hither. Now notice, don't miss this, the end of verse 26. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. Can I ask you a question this morning? Brother Jones and I have talked about this. Can I ask you a question? Where's the fourth? Why didn't he come out? What's the reason? The reason I believe, we can take some solace in this, the fourth is still in that fire. Because the next time you go in it, whatever it is, you can be rest assured that he's there with you. It's a blessing. The point is this, and regardless, by the way, regardless, God's going to, whether he delivers us or not, he is still God. Now, uh, fourthly, notice, if you would, just a couple more thoughts and we'll wrap it up this morning. Notice, fourthly, your faith may cost you something. We notice here in verse 35, women received their dead raised to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Now, this is the great paradox. You may be delivered, but you may not. Remember a couple years ago, our life verse, our life verse, our theme verse for the year, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Your faith may cost you something, regardless of the outcome of any given situation in your life. Regardless. Because some were delivered, if you read the text, I don't have time to develop the whole thing, but if you read the text, some were delivered and some were not. Some get an illness and God takes them home. Others get cured. You say, how do we quantify that? I don't know. He's God. Be still and know that I'm God. His ways are not our ways. We, we, we'll find out when we get to glory. We can't reconcile. It's hard to fully understand uh, what's going on and how God works in that regard. But some were delivered and some were not. Regardless of the outcome, I, it's important to remember this. God is still God. God is still holy, God is still just, and God is still good. We have to remember that. Your faith may cost you something. Some women received their children raised from the dead. That's what it says in the text. Remember, remember the widow of Zarephath? Remember the Shumanite? They both, but others, were tortured. Others had trial of cruel mockings. Others were imprisoned. We may never deal with that, but we can say on a smaller scale, and it's, don't miss this, your faith and my faith may cost us something. I, I made reference to this last week. If you stand for what you believe in, it may cost you some friends. Because you're just not simply willing to participate in that particular lifestyle, whatever they're doing. If you stand for what you believe in, it may cost you a particular promotion or a particular job because you've been asked to do something that is not consistent with your Christian faith. If you stand for what you believe in by faith, you may be ridiculed. God only knows there may come a time where it costs us our lives. We don't know what the future holds if the Lord tarries. History is full of examples of this. And one of the greatest consolations, and, and don't miss this, is that regardless if we're delivered or not delivered, yes, God is still God, but we have to remember the Bible does say to die is gain. From our human perspective, it's like, what? Because we it's in us to want to survive. It, the, the strongest drive man has is his will to live. It's just there. It's just, that's how God put it. But we have to remember if God does take us home or something does happen or we lose a loved one, it does say that. I'll, I'll read you just a couple of verses. Psalm 116 verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Ponder that. Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Paul said in Philippians 1, I'm in a strait. He said, betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5.8, he said, for to die is gain. Or actually, that's 2 Corinthians 5.8. We are confident, I say and willing rather, to be absent from the body, help me out church, is to be what? Boom. If I drop dead right here, I'm absent from the body. 
but I'm present with the Lord. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible says it, and I believe it. I think we need to remind it of this truth. Your faith may cost you something. Another practical example would be this. You, you may look at your neighbor. They drive in. They're driving a brand new, what's the cool, the, uh, the uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I get this little, Lexus, Mercedes, a, uh, Tesla. How's that? There's it. And, and yet you're sitting there, man, that's a nice car. Look at that thing. Man, it only takes them two hours to fuel up and whatever, but. <laughs> and they're driving this Tesla. And you're going, if I, you know, but yet you honor God with the first fruits of all of your increase. And, and you're then doing the math. You know, my offering could cover that payment every month. Your neighbor pulls in with a new boat and you're like, I, I could have that boat. You know what they say? It's best if your friend owns one. But anyway, you're, you're thinking, well, if I didn't get my effort every week, I could have that. And the list goes on. There, there, are two, there are two things to remember when it comes to that. Your job and my job is not to lay up treasure down here. It's not. Whether you believe it or not, you and I are going to stand before God and we're going to give an account to what he has given to us. Period. And, and that's, the Bible's replete with verses on that. I want to lay up treasure in heaven. How about you? Your faith may cost you something. And don't ever forget, just don't ever forget this. A faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. Lastly, your faith joins you with a glorious past. Hebrews chapter number 11, as we conclude this series, look if you would at verse 39. And these, all having obtained a good report. And by, by the way, real quick, I said this in the first part of the series. And God giving, I use the analogy, God giving a report card. Hebrews 11, 2, same chapter. When we know faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. And here it is at the closing part of the chapter. These obtained a good report. I do believe in my heart of hearts. It may not be A's and B's and C's, but any way you study the judgment seat of Christ, I'm going to give an account for my life. Your faith joins you with a glorious past. Now, as, as these verses continue, we talk about all the heroes of the Old Testament, Daniel in the lion's den, the, the, the men and women who didn't think they could, but they trusted God anyway. These verses bring us back to a good report in verse 2, but I want to close this series with this. This chapter is full of people just like you and me. I want you to think about that and remember, get over the misconception that God only uses perfect people. God only uses ministers, missionaries, pastors, assistant pastors. No, 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 no. No, God uses willing people. Willing people. We need to get over the misconception of that. So my question as we close this thought this morning in this series is, who will be the next hero of the faith? Why not you? Who will respond to God's call? Why not you? Who will step out in faith? Who will dream big dreams for God? Why not you? Who will lead their family to follow by faith? Who will risk opposition from the world? Why not you? Who will give up, as we read in Hebrews 11 towards the end, pleasures of this world for the sake of the cross? Why not you? I know it was Russell Wilson when they went, won the Super Bowl and he started out with that theme, why not us? Why not us? Why not us? I say praise God to that. Why not you? Why not me? Who's going to be the next one to step out in faith and just say, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and share my faith with that neighbor that I've been saying hi to all the time. I'm just going to let them know. Just give them an invitation to church and say, you know, I've been thinking about you. Is there anything I could pray for you about? And any way you can plant to seed, just stepping out in faith, doing something a little extraordinary for the Lord. And part of that means you got to get out of your comfort zone our comfort zones. And I said this on Thursday night, the older we get, the easier it is to get into our comfort zone. I look at our choir, just because I know that comfort zones, as time goes on, the older you get, the more we all get entrenched in them. That's why they send young men to battle. There's something to be said about it. The older we get. And I look at the choir, and we've got a great group of young people in our choir. But we also have a, good, a great group of Older folks in our choir. You say, well, what's older? I'm not even going to get into that, what's older? <laughs> get stoned in the pulpit here. But you know what? They got to get up 
737, some ladies 5, in the morning to get ready. <laughs> I'm in trouble. I just need to close in prayer. Well, but you know what? I, listen, that takes effort. That takes discipline. That takes character. That takes commitment. For you guys to come out and I see you guys up there and singing and singing for the Lord and, and doing something for God. I think of Ernestine who's battling all kinds of health issues and here she is and, and she's up there singing for the glory of God and others no doubt. Praise God! And that could go through all the ministries of here at Open Door as people serve God. Look in your hymnal at page 161 and I'm done. Page 161 When you have that kind of faith, there'll be nothing you can't accomplish. And Martin Luther understood this. Martin Luther, Martin Luther understood this. You know, the Bible says, and we talked a lot about this in the second part of the, the first part of this, being able to see him who is invisible. An interesting study for you to read is the biography of Martin Luther. And uh, you talk about a guy full of faith Talk about a guy that battled the devil. You talk about a guy who thought when he was translating the Bible, he thought the devil was in the room and he took the ink and threw it in the printing room across the room because he thought he was in there. With just He just felt oppressed as he was trying to translate the Bible. Martin Luther under, understood this when it comes to faith. And notice what he says in your hymnal on page 161. He says this, look at the third verse. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God hath willed to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure for lo, I love this, his doom is sure. One little word befell him. Why not you? Why not us? Can I encourage you in this regard? Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly